Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. This is the Adam Messer Show, and I'm your host, Adam Messer. And playing in the background there is Sebastian Messer. You're uh, familiar with him if you tune into the show regularly. But Bass, do you want to play a little bit for us? This is a new song that he, uh, he came up with. Are you going to play that one that you came up with? Okay, there we go. Thanks a lot. Okay, so everybody, um, with our guest today, we have <clears throat> Ron Forder, F-O-R-T-I-E-R. And I was just asking him earlier if it was Forder or Fortier. And uh, Ron, you, I think you and I have a common uh, problem with, uh, like, my last name is Messer, so I always say mess with an er. So um, welcome to the show, man. How are you? I'm doing fine, Adam. And thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, so everybody... Um, Ron is a comics and pulp writer and editor, and he's best known for his work with the Green Hornet comic series and Terminator, Burning Earth, with Alex Ross. He won a Pulp Factory Award for Best Pulp Short Story in 2011 for Vengeance is Mine, which appeared in Moonstone's The Avenger, Justice, Inc., and in 2012, The Ghoul, from the anthology Monster Aces. He is the managing editor of Airship 27 Productions, a leading new pulp fiction publisher, and writes in continuing adventures of both his own characters, Brother Bones, the undead Avenger, and the classic pulp hero, Captain Hazard, Champion of Justice. In 2017, he was awarded the first pulp grandmaster by the Pulp Factory. Forder also writes a highly popular pulp fiction review blog. And then, so yeah, that's that's a lot, Ron. Uh, you know, Bobby Nash, uh, I just want to take a, a second here because Bobby uh, introduced us. And, um, you know, everybody, I just want you to uh, take a moment. Um, Bobby had some unfortunate um, issues. His brother passed away last night, and you all know he's been on the show a, a bunch. And Bobby's a good friend of both mine and Ron's. So I just want to, uh, you know, say a prayer for uh, Bobby and his dad. And, you know, uh, you know, really, it's just tragic. So. I uh, love Bobby to death. He's a great guy, and you know, so I wanted to share that with y'all because he's been on the show quite a bit. So, um, yeah, and let me let me add my own condolences if I can, Adam. Because yes, you're please. right, Bobby. Bobby's a a really great guy. He's he's a wonderful writer, uh, an exceptional writer, and uh, this this came to a shock, you know, a shock to all of us. And so my own heartfelt sympathies and condolences to him, his dad, and and everybody who knew his brother. Uh, you know, it's one of those things in life, I guess, we have to treasure every single day. Oh, I completely agree. And, you know, uh, it's it's interesting how I met uh, Bobby, uh, Ron, and I'd like to hear your story on you met Bobby. Um, but I used to do conventions here in Savannah, um, and there was a convention called GnomeCon here. And I met a guy, uh, you probably know this guy too, uh, Randy Bishop. And, yes. And he does the Hawk of New York. So I met Randy, and uh, so I was doing photography, and you know, I wanted to start you know, learning about publishing and that kind of thing. And Randy and I, we like to draw and that kind of stuff. So we kind of hit it off, and we became friends. And then Randy was like, hey, you know, there's this guy that you know, I think you should meet, whatever. And he introduced me to Bobby. And so I met Bobby like in 2014 or whatever. And, uh, he's, I've interviewed him a bunch of times. He's been on the show a bunch of times. Um, he's been to my convention, uh, the Savannah Quill and, uh, he's just a huge supporter of, uh, you know, of other independent authors and, you know, he's, he is a really fantastic writer too. Uh, but he's, you know, overall, I, I just think he's a great guy. And, um, you know, so that's how I met him. So how did you meet, uh, Bobby? I met Bobby, oh, years ago at the one and only Dragon Con. 
mm. that I attended, and, right. and I'm talking quite a few years now. And I I was down there with some friends, and uh, Bobby was one of the group that all of us were. They they put the comic book people. You, you'll die laughing at this, Adam. They put us basically under a stairwell. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if people have never been to we, Dragon we, Con, we, it's, we feel it's, okay it's, with it's, like closets and basements and stuff like that. We're used to like, yeah, you know, it's insane. It, re- it really is. I mean, they have so many people. They're in two hotels, one across the street from the other, right? And so, you know, we we get up, and you know, at the time I was I was still living back in New England. I'm originally from uh, Southern New Hampshire, and so if I fly down there and I, I get into the hotel and go to the hall where you know the convention is going to be held where we're going to, where we're stationed and i meet a bunch of guys including i said uh bobby was there and bishop bowie and i'm trying to remember some of the other people i met there for the first time and so it's like where are we setting up and bobby says oh they've got us over here by the stairwell and i went you got to be kidding and he says oh no here we go so we got these tables and behind us or over us almost where the stairs going to the second floor and then the you know the show the show started and I I I was shocked I had done the San Diego Comic Con back in the late '80s early '90s and I thought I'd pretty much seen big cons but Dragon Con's insane it's crazy I mean the minute they opened the doors they were you can't move it's uh-huh. it's like a cattle herd of people going by anyways I got to spend the weekend with Bobby and uh, the other uh, comic book writers and artists who were all of us, you know, huddled together in, in this little corner of, of the convention hall and immediately, immediately took to him because I realized what an affable gentleman he was, what a what a, a fun guy, al- always ready with, with a laugh and, and whatever. And so later, when years later, when myself and artist Rob Davis began uh, our publishing company airship 27 productions and we started you know looking around for people who might want to write what we call new pulp Mm -hmm. right revisiting classic pulp characters from the 30s and 40s one of the first people i immediately reached out to was bobby because because in in our meeting in in atlanta uh, talking about comics and stuff like that i realized we had so much in common and over the years that friendship is just been cemented he's done a lot of work for us at airship 27 plus a lot of other new pulp publishers out there and you know what i i think i don't know if you're familiar with this adam you may be but i think it's well worth mentioning as we're talking about bobby that uh bobby won this year's pulp factory award for best new pulp novel yeah i saw that that was awesome yeah, he did. He wrote, he actually wrote a, a novel uh, adapting an American comic uh, from uh, Bill Black's outfit in Florida, Night Vale, a comic character that he actually wrote a prose novel, uh, and the title I believe was Crossroads at Infinity, and uh, again, hands down winner, uh, a well deserved thing. And so you know, hey. Uh, the the more the more I, I get to know Bobby, the more I'm impressed with him, and we we jokingly kid him all the time that he is a guru at self promotion. Oh yeah, Bobby is uh, great at uh, you know sharing and marketing and you know doing all that stuff, and he's also a really good uh, advocate for you know, helping other people um, and sharing other people's stuff and. Yeah, you know, just always a really friendly, fun guy. Um, so. Oh yeah, when 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 young when young writers after you know we'll publish things and young writers will say, well, how do I market my 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 short story or how do I market my novel? And I always point them towards Bobby. I mm-hmm. said, go hook up with Bobby Nash on Facebook and then watch what this guy does. It it blows me away all the time. And I've been doing this you know uh, publishing thing now for well we're going on about fifteen years. Mm-hmm. And I still don't think anybody does it as as smart and as wise as Bobby does. Uh, he could teach classes in this. Oh yeah, yeah, I definitely agree. Um, that was one of the things I liked about um, when I met Bobby was we I I was 
getting into wanting to write and publish, and I just started uh, writing for the newspaper as a freelance journalist uh, here in Savannah, the Savannah Morning News, and um, I was just asked. I just you know was asking. I was like, hey, you know, I've never really written any fiction, um, and I was just asking him all kinds of questions and. You know, we became friends, and you know, I uh, I ask him from time to time if I can, uh, you know, pick his brain a little bit and, and see what you know he's got, you know, some feedback or whatever. And and it's kind of weird. Uh, you, I'm sure you've seen this, Ron, but in the publishing business, especially the indie publishing business, there I like to call it uh, shovels and jeans, uh, because like back in the day with um, the California Gold Rush. It wasn't really the miners making the money. It was the folks selling the shovels and jeans to the miners. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so I like to call it shovels and jeans. So, like, there's a lot of, and that, not just in the publishing industry, but there are a lot of shovels and jeans out there. And, uh, you know, hey, if you do this, you can make, you know, be the next millionaire, or whatever. And it's it's interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm still new with publishing fiction and writing fiction and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm not new to the world <laughs> and i'm not new to you know published writing uh, it's just there's a lot of folks out there and you know bobby has always been one of those guys it's like you know you you get to know people and you know you can sense you can size people up and sense you know if somebody's being genuine or not and if if you feel like they are but then you get hoodwinked you know eventually they'll show their true colors right yeah, Bobby's right. one of those guys that he's always been just a wonderful person, very helpful, very friendly. Um, no, uh, no mean bone in his body. I mean, like I've never heard Bobby say anything bad about anybody. And oh no, uh, I, I mean this. This is you know it, it's it's an old saw, but this is the guy who would who would literally give you the shirt off his back. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So <laughs> love Bobby to death, man. He's, he's a great guy. And, uh, you know, he's always introducing me to really cool people. So I'm glad, uh, we had a chance to get to uh, meet each other and, and folks listening in, um, you're listening to us here on WRUU LP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah soundings community radio with global soul. And this is the first time, uh, everybody, uh, that Ron and I've actually talked, um, on the phone. Uh, we've communicated a little bit on Facebook, but not a whole lot so you're getting to hear it first y'all we're getting to know each other just like you're getting to hear it and and know us so uh, it's pretty cool yeah yeah, pretty much i I have i have to add this adam because i wasn't you know when when you invited me on the show i wasn't exactly uh sure you know of the particulars and now that i realize that your your station in savannah i have to tell you uh my wife valerie that's one of those city she's always wanted to visit mm. it's like it's on the top of her bucket list all right i where this comes from i i particularly don't know like i said we're, we're new england people originally now mm-hmm. we're living out here in colorado but she had seen movies or whatever that took place in the south you know era movies and whatever mm-hmm. and has always been fascinated by the city of Savannah. So it's, it, you know, it, it's a coincidence that we're talking about that. And she'll get a kick out of that when I tell her uh, what station I am going to be on. Oh yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, um, you would love it. I mean, it's so beautiful right now. is probably not the best time to come because you know, everything going on, but you know, when, when it relaxes and, you know, things kind of go back to normal, um, it's beautiful. I mean, like there's so many things to do down here. You know, if you're into, uh, historical tours or, you know, restaurants or, you know, there's not sporting, go- uh, events and stuff like that. Well, I take that back. We do have the Savannah bananas, but, um, I think their season's going to start back up in July, but, um, you know, it, Savannah has so many different things, especially if you like pulp, you like pulp fiction, obviously. Um, we have a lot of different historical, uh, ghost tours and, you know, things mm. like that. Yeah, they're yeah. just wonderful, awesome, you know, especially uh, if you like colonial, uh, like cobblestones and buildings, stuff like that. And right. just a lot I of love, wonderful stuff. I'm, I'm a history buff, Adam. I love anything to do with history. Uh, I uh, I remember uh, when I when I first got into high school um, and studied American history, mm-hmm. I, you know, learned about the, uh, the American Civil War. And I have been a Civil War buff ever since. Mm. So all this, you know, idea, um, I've been to Gettysburg and, and other places further north, but I've never really been uh, to the south all that much. 
Florida uh, a few, you know, several times. And I've been to, uh, trying to think back, Mississippi. And then what else? Then, of course, like I said, Dragon Con in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. But that's just a handful, a handful of times. And it's an area of the country I was very, very much like to spend a little more time in. Well, hopefully uh, this will uh, give your, you and your wife uh, an incentive to come on down and check out the beautiful hostess city so it is uh, i love savannah i moved down here in 96 and um i love it it's just a wonderful place to live and to to be and my wife and i uh you know raised our kids here and it's just a lot of you know it's i, I think it's so crazy because um the hollywood version of savannah you know obviously hollywood kind of hypes things up you know <laughs> and, and people don't really talk with that southern, you know, like that Hollywood southern drawl. Uh, some people have, you know, like I like to call it like the Savannah, um, the Savannah dialect, um, because they have certain things, you know, certain phrases that you know locals. Obviously, you know, anywhere you're from, you know, the locals are going to have like little little phrases or whatever. Exactly. But uh, Savannah's always been so welcoming, especially to um, you know our friends that come from all over the world to Savannah. And I think you and your wife would love it, especially if you, you know, you're a history buff and, you know, she likes the, um, I guess, I don't, I don't know how to call it. Like maybe the romanticized, um, quaint version of a Savannah. There you go. I, I think, I think you pretty, you pretty much nailed it. I think she'd I think love it. The, do, the documentary she's seen and whatever does paint a very, very beautiful city with a, a rich history and background. Oh yeah. And, and culture. And so those are the kind of things, you know, that I, that I know appeal to her. So, oh, yeah. hey, who knows? You know, like I said, uh, the good Lord will, and maybe one day we'll make it happen. Yeah, yeah, I think you'd enjoy it. So, uh, Ron, let me uh, ask you more about yourself. Um, I, you, you like Pulp Fiction and you like uh, comics, you know, characters and stuff like that from the 30s and 40s. Um, when did you first uh, start getting into comic books and, and Pulp Fiction and stuff? Well, uh, uh, I'll give you a, a, a hopefully a re- reader's digest <laughs> version of this. Uh, I've always been a comic book uh, fan ever since I was a, a child. I mean, my dad actually got me hooked on comics before I could even read Adam. I mean, oh, cool. He, yeah, uh, I'm. I'm. You know, uh, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm gonna give you my my age away easily. I'm a, a baby boomer. Dad was in World War II. And he came home in 1945. Him and mom got married, like thousands of other uh, returning servicemen from from that war. And in the following year, here we came by the thousands and millions. Right, 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 yeah. Right. Okay, so my growing up basically uh, was was with radio for a long time until television came along and going to the movies with my dad. Now, my dad got me hooked on two of the greatest passions of my life. And the first, like I said, was comics in that he would uh, be working and, and mom would stay home and, and run the household. I was the oldest of four children. And on weekends, mom would have her special to do list for dad. And he'd go out around our small little New England town and, and do whatever errands she had. And while he was out, he would stop, at a local grocery store or uh, drugstore where they had the spinner racks. Yeah. yeah. And, he, and he would pick up a bunch of comics. Now he'd pick up uh, cowboy comics and crime comics for himself. And for mom, he'd pick up, you know, true romance or true confession comics. And, and people, and I think it's sad that people don't realize that, uh, you know, from the golden age of the forties through the fifties, there was every kind of comic book genre you could think out there. Yeah. And so, so dad would pick up several comics. He'd come home, they'd have lunch. Now this is being, like I said, Saturday, they'd have lunch. My brother, George was a year and a half younger than I was. And so around the time I was about five, my memory starts to kick in that after lunch, we would be playing in the living room. They would turn on this, this big old, you know, big troller or, or whatever you call it, uh, record player and get in dance music from, from local stations. And the two of them would spend the afternoon reading their comic books That's or cool. other mag. Oh yeah. Or other magazines, if you will. And I desperately, you know, wanted to know, you know, wanted one of those things that, that fascinated my parents so much. 
And mom was like, well, why don't you give Ron one of your comics? You know, and dad's like, right. And it's going to end up either in his mouth or he'll rip it to shreds, one or the other. And so mom very wisely told him one day, well, look, the next time you're at the store next week and you're buying your cowboy, you know, your co- cowboy comics, pick up two of the same title. Now, Adam, they, they, they were like taking 10 cents a piece in those days. Right, right. So, so dad comes home that, that Saturday for lunch, and actually he had bought two copies. And th- this is a story you've probably heard a lot of times from other comic book fanatics like yours truly. But we all have a sense of remembering the mm. first time anyone ever gave us a comic. Yeah. Okay. So dad bought two issues of kid cult outlaw oh cool and he gave me one of them and that that was the beginning all right i couldn't read the doggone thing but i could sit on the rug and flip through the pages right and appreciate the artwork Mm -hmm. all right and and you know these were cowboys these were indians you know they had six guns and it was is all the wild west stuff well he kept doing that and i kept devouring comic books to the point where i wanted to know what was going on in the word balloons i wanted to know what was going on in the captions all right i wanted to learn how to read and mom again stepped in and by the time i was like six she started to teach me how to use a dictionary awesome. so that as i was reading comics and i came across a word i didn't understand i'd run grab the dictionary and and so it, it goes you know by the time i was ready for school uh, I was very much ahead of my peers as far as reading and comprehension. And that gave me a lifelong appreciation of storytelling, of writing, of literature. Uh, you know, I, I, I remained a comic book fan all my life. But it, even by the time I was in high school, Adam, and, and still loving comics and, and beginning to grasp what they were, their history, etc., um, it still it wasn't enough to satisfy my my hunger for reading and I got into paperbacks and just, again, I, to this day, uh, you know, a ferocious reader and ultimately all of which led to, you know, this dream one day of, of doing this myself, of writing comics, science fiction, fantasy novels, adventure novels, and bit by bit, uh, I worked, I worked very hard at it. I, I finished high school. I worked, in several factories and then went in the military. I was in the army between 1965 and 1968. When I came home from Vietnam in 68, the summer of 68, I immediately started writing comic book scripts and sending them out to various publishers and whatever. It wouldn't be for another, I'm trying to think 10, 11 years before I actually got my first check. And acceptance. So that's a lot of rejection. Wow. That's wow. a long the way. So, but, but you, you, if you got in '68, and then so you got, um, you were published uh, first. Your first comic published, what, 1978, 70. What, what uh, was your first comic that got published? The first professional comic I ever had published was published uh, by a little known, well, uh, now long gone, uh, what you want to call B Company. All right, well, it wasn't the big boys in New York. But in Derby, Connecticut, there was this great little comic company called Charlton Comics. All right. And Charlton was was a was a publishing house. And from what I understand of its history, the reason they ultimately got into doing comics, because they published everything that, you know, were were available at that time that most people would recognize as as we talked about before. The the average magazines uh, you know, for, for women, for men, mechanics, illustrated, and stuff like this. The point was that what they learned, they had these giant printing presses. And so you would turn them on and you would run them and you'd run these giant rolls of paper. They produce all these magazines that, that brought them in a nice profit and, and made a good living. But somehow or other, there was a gap between publishing one issue and another issue of something else where the presses were idle and if the presses were idle they were losing money so somebody in charlton's you know hierarchy realized that they needed to publish other things that they could just knock off but keep the presses running and keep them efficient Mm. and so they got into the comic book business Mm. 
Okay, and that was Charlton Comics, and they were they were around. I want to say they were around probably from the uh, the late forties through the sixties, and towards the end of the sixties is is pretty much uh, they were on their last leg, which is about the time I was coming into the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they were having a hard time. Uh, just in the publishing realm alone, the comics weren't selling all that well. They were doing mostly reprints. And one day in, I want to say 70, early 70, uh, the editor, uh, uh, assistant editor, uh, the editor was George Wildman. And he had this idea of soliciting new comic book strips from amateurs that instead of paying them a check, they would pay them in 50 copies of the published comic. Hmm. Okay. So I find out about this because at the time I was subscribing to an industry weekly newspaper called the comic book buyer's guide. Mm -hmm. And one day I get a copy of the buyer's guide and I'm flipping through it. And I see this, this announcement that Charlton comics is actually looking for, you know, new writers, rookies. Okay. What can you do? Well, Prior to that, in those two years since I'd come back from uh, the Army and back into civilian life, I had really begun collecting what we call fanzines. And if your listeners don't know what those are, those are amateur magazines published on mimeograph machines and whatever. Right, right. Right, done by young creators who wanted to know more about the business. And through one of those fanzines, I had hooked up with a young artist named Gary Cato who lived in Honolulu, Hawaii. And so we had begun a correspondence. Again, this was pre-computers, no internet. And Gary's dream was to be a comic book artist as much as mine was to be a comic book writer. Mm -hmm. So the second I saw the uh, Charlton ad, I actually picked up the phone and called Gary at home in Honolulu and said, have you seen the buyer's guide this week? Gary had read the same article. And I said, we need to give this a shot. He says, okay, well, you, you know, write up a script, send it to me, and let's, let's go for it. So I spent the next few days, wrote a, uh, an 11-page space opera called Duel in the Stars, uh, pretty much kind of like Star Trek or, or you know, Star Wars kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and put it in a manila envelope, send it airmail to Hawaii, and that's it. Gary got it and went to work at it. Oh. So. I, I don't hear anything else. In the meantime, I've since the history of all this, I learned that uh, through the associate editor, a gentleman named Bill Pearson, this project was labeled Bullseye. And in the first few weeks that it was announced, Charlton's head offices, I think, got thousands of submissions. I mean, literally thousands. Mm -hmm. And so they went through them. And what they started doing was picking the ones that they wanted to use. And these were, you know, already illustrated. They weren't so much looking for scripts as ready artwork that they could simply slap into a book and get it out. Right. Okay. And as it turns out, I, you know, that uh, I mean, I've been blessed many times, Adam, but uh, connecting with Gary Cotter was one of the greatest blessings of my life because Gary was so talented even back then at the start of his career, that he took my script. Not only did he pencil it, he inked it and lettered it. Oh, wow. So so by the time his 11 pages and this big package showed up in Connecticut, it was camera ready. It that's was it was ready awesome. to go. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All, they had, all they really had to do was color it. They had in-house colorists. And so next thing I know, it's, it's like, you know, I, I want to say maybe it's a month, a month and a half, since uh, I talked with Gary about this whole thing and sent him the script. And one day I go to the mail and I have this letter from Derby, Connecticut. I see the logo child from comics. Boy, did I open that one up fast. Oh, I bet. And, <clears throat> yeah, and sure enough, it's the associate editor, Bill Pearson, saying that they were delighted and thrilled with the pages, with the story, and they were going to publish it in one of their uh, horror anthologies. Uh, no, excuse me, in the Bullseye. It was going to be in the third issue of the Tryout magazine. That was the thing. And so the third issue of Charlton's Bullseye featured uh, 
a whole bunch of amateur stories. I think there were three or four of them in it. And one of those being ours, Duel in the Stars. So officially, you know, I got my 50 copies in the mail. Gary got his 50 copies. And we were professionals. Um, it, it, it was such a, a euphoric experience and, and a delight, and especially, like I said, after, you know, butting my head against the wall and, and getting all those rejection slips. So That's awesome, I stopped. Well, we, uh, you know, we it, need to um, take a break real quick. Um, so hold that thought, and we'll come back, Ron, um, and we'll finish up in just a minute, okay? You got it. Thanks. This portion of WRUULP Savannah Soundings Programming is brought to you by listeners and the Ships of the Sea Museum. One of the hidden secrets of the Ships of the Sea Museum is its gardens. Native plants are interspersed with exotic tropical plants throughout the gardens. Visitors can enjoy everything that has earned the Ships of the Sea Museum, the Trip Experts 2015 Experts Choice Award. You can find out more about the Ships of the Sea Museum at the website shipsofthesea.org. Now you have a chance to support both Savannah Independent Artists and WRUU during this shelter-in-place order to stop the spread of COVID-19. Creatives in Need is a group of independent artists hosted by the Roots Up Gallery, which is collaborating with WRUU during this shelter-in-place to offer an online art gallery at www.rootsupgallery.com. For every work of art sold at this online gallery, the artists receive 80% from the sales and 20% goes to WRUU and its programs like Art on the Air. Interested listeners can go to www.rootsupgallery.com to start shopping today. Voting is now open for Connect Savannah's annual Best of Savannah Readers Poll, and WRUU is once again on the ballot. Last year, you voted us best in the local radio station and talk radio station categories. Continue your support of WRUU 107.5 FM by again voting for us in the best local radio station and best local talk radio station categories. And this year, vote for your favorite WRUU morning program and favorite WRUU host. Voting ends at 11.59 p.m. sharp on Sunday, May 3rd. And results will be revealed the night of Tuesday, May 19th. For details and voting, visit ConnectSavannah.com. And as always, thank you for listening to, supporting, and voting for WRUULP Savannah. All right, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, you are listening to The Adam Messer Show, and this is WRUULP Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. And my special guest today is a fellow named Ron Forter. And we have been talking about his uh, pulp fiction career and uh, love for comic books and that kind of thing. So, Ron, um, you were telling us right before the break how you had your first comic book, um, I guess the 11 page, you know, uh, comic book or whatever published with Charlton Comics and the Bullseye magazine. So can you pick up where you left off? Of course I can. Uh, and basically what happened was after this was published uh, and we got those 50 copies, I told you that we got in lieu of cash. Mm -hmm. uh, we and also back then that would have been about $5 worth of, of comics, right? They're 10 cents a piece. Yeah, pretty, you got it. <laughs> That's actually, you know, 10 cents back then was... I remember uh, my dad, he was born in 54, and I remember uh, I was born in 76, and I remember my dad telling me as a kid that you know he could go to the corner store with a dollar and get like a quart of milk, a loaf of bread, and a dozen eggs, have change left over to be able to buy a candy bar or, you know, comic book oh, or whatever. Oh, oh Lord. Oh, yeah. Lord. God. Hey, I mean, one, one, you know, I was telling you about the, the Saturday morning routines that we had in the house. One of the Sunday routines we had was we would travel – to one of my grandparents, my mom's folks, mm -hmm. and, and go have Sunday dinner with them uh, every Sunday. And I was the oldest grandchild in that side of the family. Huh. So my grandparents, you know, were all over me. 
uh, and, you know, like, like the golden child, if you will, okay? And so whenever we went to visit them in the neighboring town, my grandmother, the minute we came in the door, she'd give me a big hug and a kiss, and then she'd give me a dollar hmm. and say, you know, go, go, go ahead. There was a corner drugstore right down the street. She says, go ahead, Ron. She goes, you know, she says, I know you like your funny books, which is what she called them, right? And so I was off like a shot, all right? And I'd come back with 10 comic books. Mm -hmm. Ten. Okay. And I mean, I'd while away the afternoon while the adults were talking about this or that, reading comics, all right? But to go back to Charlton, uh, Bill, Bill Pearson, the associate uh, editor of this whole Bullseye project, was really so taken with what Gary and I had done that when sending us the 50 copies, he also included a short note that said, please send us something else. We really like what you guys have done. Okay. So I pick up the phone again and call Gary in Hawaii and said, well, look, you know, let's be fair here. Uh, I came up with this, this, you know, space opera kind of thing. And you just went right along and, and, and delivered it, made it absolutely beautiful enough that, you know, we got it published. Uh, they want another story from us. What would you like to draw? And boy, you want to talk about that's also monumental in my life and my career. Gary replies and goes, well, you know, he goes, he says, I love the old, you know, golden age comedy superheroes like Plastic Man. Mm -hmm. And I went, OK. He goes, he says, wouldn't it be cool if we had a, a hero who could break apart like a jigsaw puzzle and then mentally put his parts back together again? Okay, now I'm going, oh, boy, what did, what did I just walk into, right? And so I'm laughing with him on the telephone, and, of course, I went, all right, well, we'll call him that. We'll call him Mr. Jigsaw, man of a thousand parts. Hmm. And Gary goes, yeah, all right, go to it, Ron. Well, yeah, go to it. I, I, over the years, I've written so many things, Adam, but what I learned early on, and, and it was almost intuitive, is that, one of the hardest things in the world to write isn't horror, action, adventure, or anything. It's comedy. Comedy, yeah. Because you you walk that fine line where you want the readers to be uh, sympathetic to your character. Not so much laugh at him as a buffoon, but as somebody who gets into, you know, jams or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah, all right, and, and be on his side. So that being the case. I sat back and thought, and, and again, living in New England and, and rural small towns, I went, you know, wouldn't it be cool to create a character who was right out of high school with this, this weird superpower, right, and terribly naive? And because he's that naive and he's a good guy and, and people like him, he'd always find himself maybe biting off more than he could chew. But in the end, because of his personality and his, his good heart and his friends he'd always triumph and that was that was the gear in my head and i created a character called charlie grant hmm. who ends up who ends up living in portland maine a beautiful little seaside town and becomes friend with a uh, crime reporter on the portland herald uh, a woman named amy uh Boucher, and she becomes more or less his older sister mentor type on being a superhero, all right? And so we wrote that origin story. I, I scripted it, sent it to Gary. Gary sent it off to Charlton again. We're doing this again. But in the interim, come to find out, Charlton decided that the Bullseye Project wasn't working and they were going to cancel it, and they had started sending back submissions to people. Okay, so I'm thinking to myself, well, that's too bad. Obviously, you know, nobody's ever going to get to see Mr. Jigsaw. But once again, Bill Pearson comes through, and Gary and I both get a letter where he says that after some ref reflection, he, him and the general, the managing editor decided they would keep about a half dozen submissions that they really liked, but were now published them in some of their other titles, which at this time, as I mentioned earlier, were nothing but reprints. And so lo and behold, they decided to take our Mr. Jigsaw origin story, make it the cover feature for their, their, their magazine called scary tales. They went to Gary, they called Gary, asked him to do a cover of Mr. Jigsaw 
on the cover of Scary Tales number 38. And that issue features a story by Pat Boyette, a reprint, a story by Steve Ditko, a reprint, and the first appearance ever of our comedy superhero, Mr. Jigsaw Man of a Thousand Parts, which which after 35 some odd years, we are still writing his adventures and self-publishing them now. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. Uh, what's your newest work that you're working on? Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, comic wise, what I'm working on right now and, and the big shift, obviously, and, and you know, you're aware of, and I'm sure all your listeners are all right. Is that after, uh, um, a career and, and, you know, let me tie this all together after those two issues and child and child and eventually just collapsed and, and was gone. But by then Gary and I had started to make connections in the comic book field. And we went on to our own careers doing different things. As you mentioned at the side of the program, I ended up lucky enough to work at now comics and do Terminator, the green Hornet and a bunch of other things. Gary went on and worked with Max Allen Collins on the, mystery comic mystery uh he worked with richard and wendy piney on the elf quest comics and whatever so so we had these great careers that that lasted maybe about 30 some odd years well now today thanks to the internet thanks to things like you know print on demand and et cetera et cetera it's it's my personal feeling that the evolution of comics in america is really um going down the path of the independence uh -huh. and and people self-publishing as we're talking about all right so this myself and my art director rob davis aside from doing our pulp novels and anthologies years ago decided well let's revive some of our old comic book projects that we own that that are our property and one of those is mr jigsaw so rob began his own publishing little outfit called red bud studios and that's how we've been doing the mr jigsaw now i want to say about a year and a half ago i was on facebook one day and i received a message from a very talented artist that i, I was familiar with a gentleman named cesar feliciano and cesar had this idea in his mind for a graphic a series of graphic novels dealing with two ultra sophisticated assassins oh. and one is a, a martial artist from china and the other is a female military uh professional from russia and the story and, and the the gimmick that that cesar had for for this concept was the martial artist is named sammy jinn and his father learned martial arts through various forms and was eventually uh, kicked out of a, a, a debt cults kind of group and is on, on the run with his baby son. But at the same time, he's, he's you know teaching him all these skills to defend himself. And the boy's name is Sammy Jin, J-I-N. Whereas the female half of this, this concept is an artificial I say artificial. She was actually raised or, or evolved in an artificial womb in a secret laboratory in Siberia where her where the fetus was enhanced with super plasma, et cetera, et cetera. So that at the time she's actually born, she's stronger, faster, smarter than the average human being. And her name is uh, Nadia. I want to say this correct, okay? So Nigel uh, Tonikova, all right? So here's, here's Cesar's idea for the name of the series. Mm -hmm. Gin and Tonic. Oh. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, so, 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 basically, so basically, you know, when Cesar, you know, is, is, mess is trying to message me this stuff, so finally I said, Cesar, I says, this sounds a little bit, you know, involved. I said, send me what you got. So he, sent, he he emails me this one page treatment. And the idea behind what he wanted to do was both Sammy and uh, uh, Nadja basically are brought up by two evil organizations and trained to be assassins. 
and they go through the early phases of their life doing these bad things. But somewhere in the concept of the story is they actually cross paths at one point where they have the same target. And without getting way too much involved with, with a lot of other things that go on, is when they actually meet for the first time, there is an epiphany that occurs and both of them realize that they've just they are really just being manipulated like puppets and they're not really nice people they've done awful bad things and so somehow or other they understand they need some form of redemption some form of salvation and the two of them together decide the only way that's possible is if they actually take down the organizations that created them. Oh, okay. Okay. But because those organizations did raise them, did train them, did know their weaknesses and strengths, they swap off. So Sammy goes after the Soviet Union KGB assassin section, and Tonikova goes after the Black Lotus in the, you know, Golden Triangle. Okay, okay. And so the concept with that, I mean, th basically, I took what Cesar had, which was a page, a plot outline of sorts, and by the time I was done with it, I had like five and a half pages of plot outlines and supporting characters, et cetera, et cetera, and send those back to him. He He really enjoyed what I had done, how I had augmented his idea, and then said, go ahead, start writing. And so I wrote the first two, what we'll, we'll, you know, we call books or chapters. Mm -hmm. But basically, I've written 85 pages of gin and tonic. And what's happening now is uh, Cesar is illustrating, I, I'm hoping, I, I believe he's going to illustrate like the, the first 10 to 15 pages. And we're eventually going to go online to a GoFunding type program, I think. So that is a, a really interesting question. We, we've got uh, a few more minutes before the end of this first hour. But with a project like that, you know, what I've seen with these uh, crowdfunding, um, like the successful ones that I've, I've followed on, I can't, you know, I'm not an expert on crowdfunding or anything like that. But, you know, just from the ones that I've observed, you know, I've sponsored you know, some of them or whatever myself, you know, I've, um, been a patron or whatever. Mm -hmm. the, um, the ones that I've seen that are really successful usually have a finished you know product already right so they'll right. have like a book or you know like a music album or you know whatever and it'll be ready to go and then they do the crowdfunding for like publishing uh fees or like uh you know the i guess the extra you know the swag stuff you know like the right the, the incentives yeah yeah so have you uh have you done any crowdfunding stuff uh before or will this be the first time or well it'll, it'll it will be for me uh this this is new to me uh whereas uh, cesar has done it a few times and he's been he, he's been successful uh and so that's why you know when when he proposed the concept of us doing this together uh my thought was and much like yourself was like look i i'm 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 a creative soul let, let me just you know work this plot out these characters out let me write this and and i have to tell you uh that he invented some really remarkable characters and i'm having a great time writing the scripts mm -hmm. but as far as you know going going online to a site like gofundme or whatever my my thought was like you know i'm going to leave that into your capable hands all right uh i'm more than willing that once he has a a page set up or whatever to help promote it any way i can uh making videos or, or or whatever and and even though you know like i said that was the general concept when we put this thing together and we started working on it last year uh in the interim uh he's been talking to um, another gentleman who runs his own comic line mm -hmm. and the pos the possibility exists that there could be a shift that ultimately uh, if, and when we're done with those first 10, 15 pages, we may instead present them to this small independent company. 
and they may pick it up, which would be ideal for us. Because personally, between you and me, like, I'd much rather have a publisher waiting and on hand. And then, like I said, I can just simply devote myself to, to writing the stories. Yeah, that's yeah, that is really neat. Um, especially your background with being a publisher. Um, yeah, there's there's so many aspects that go into publishing, and then you know writing the book is the first part, right? And then yep. putting the book packaging and all that, and you know that's a huge part. The marketing and advertising, and you know circling back to Bobby, you know that it is one of those uh, things that you know you have to just constantly do it. Um, if you want to get it out there in front of audiences and I still feel like word of mouth is the best way. Uh, but it's, it's hard to get word of mouth if you don't have, you know, like your cheerleaders or your champions out there, you know, um, and I mean, we all have them, we all have, you know, like our diehard folks and, uh, you know, that are all out there. And, you know, so I, I think one of the neat things about doing stuff like that, collaborating with people is you have a chance to, you know, meet other folks and you have a chance to, you know, see if it's a good you know fit for you and you know but it is a lot of work so i can understand uh, you know where you're like hey yeah i, I want to be part of the project but i just want to do the writing and you know and i'll help promote on my side that can but i don't want to have to do all the other because well, it is a I lot mean, of right, work right and 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 so and so that you know that your audience understands there are other avenues aside from uh you know gofundme or kickstarter uh Whereas I, I mentioned earlier that Rob Davis had, you know, decided that we would reprint a lot of our early comic stuff. Well, that led to his forming what he calls Red Bud Studios, where what we actually do is we will finish a complete book mm -hmm. and print it online. All right. So that we can go to uh, a place like Barry Gregory's Kablam and for a minimal fee he will publish one copy of our book. All mm -hmm. right. So the prototype, if you will, from that point on, if we're going to a comic book convention and we want to bring 50 copies of Mr. Jigsaw number 12, we just email, you know, uh, Barry and say, okay, we need 20 copies of, of this issue. And voila, they come in the mail. We pay, you know, a wholesale price mm -hmm. and then we sell them at conventions at retail price. Uh, you know, we're not getting rich, but we make a little bit of profit enough to keep doing this kind of stuff. Yeah, that is another aspect. We can talk more about that into the next hour as well. Uh, but yeah, I think that's one of the, the big things too, especially with indies, um, you know, especially folks that are just pretty much you're doing it yourself. You know, um, there are a lot of folks out there, you know, who are doing it like that. And uh, it just depends on how much, time and money that you want to put into it right <laughs> right well right so when we get to this to the second part of this uh ask me about daughter of dracula mm. okay we'll do that all right everybody um you are tuning in today this is the adam messer show and i'm your host adam messer and my special guest today is comics and pulp fiction writer ron forter and you're listening to us on wruulp savannah georgia 107.5 fm WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. You are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings Community Radio with Global Soul. This is Sounds of Tarab from the album Zanzibar, New York. Da canini, con gummo mi masikini, ni gummo ni ragani, ali angutan bani. Mahaba wa da canini, con gummo mi masikini, ni gummo ni ragani, ali angutan bani. Mahaba wa da canini. Ni 